Hi, everyone. Distinguished guests and dear friends, my name is Mika Lei, and I'm the Secretary General of Solidar. And it, is, and it is with great pleasure that I welcome you all to this afternoon's conversation on inequalities in the European semester and what can be done to turn the tide of negative development of the last decades. It is of absolute importance that this stays on top of the agenda in today's policy debate and as part of the recovery plans currently being drafted. The destructive effects of socioeconomic inequalities on the well-being of our societies are well-researched and dramatic. The social breaches that continues to widen at an even greater pace now during COVID-19 threaten to tear our societies apart, to erase confidence in the social contract and the institutions establish to safeguard the interests of citizens, and in the process carries the risk of derailing a path to achieve the sustainable development goal. To tackle inequality, from a power as well as an economic perspective has to be at the heart of every policy we as progressives present. And it must be um, the cornerstone of Van der Leyen's political project of an economy that works for everyone, if this project is to have any real meaning at all. A lot is at stake. Confidence in the EU, in our democratic institutions and in our labor markets is needed if we are to succeed in the structural transformation of our societies and economies that is necessary to build resilience and tackle the current health, social, economic, and climate crisis. This study and our afternoon together is co-organized by Solidar, FEPS, Calvisorza Foundation, Progressiva, and Fondazione Pietro Nenni. And I think this partnership between our organization is a great example of how academia and civil society can and should complement and reinforce each other's work and ideas. We are proud to present this study of Professor Lorenzo Antonucci and Dr. Francesco Corti. It constitutes a very interesting piece of a much larger puzzle and poses, poses some very concrete and ambitious recommendations to make the economic governance a tool that help us fight socioeconomic inequalities. The study does a great job of showing where the EU has dropped the ball by not treating social inclusion as something that benefits all Europeans and the union as a whole, reflected in the lack of a framework to monitor socioeconomic inequalities in the European semester in any meaningful way. We can no longer afford to limit our focus exclusively to poverty reduction and labor market inclusion when we can see that this approach has been unsuccessful, unsuccessful in preventing growing inequalities. And the reform of the prior, priorities of our economic governance has become all the more urgent now that the European semester will play a key role in the implementation of the national recovery plans. In fact, in the current crisis, we have seen existing inequalities, including job security, income, in, income security, and access to essential services grow and new inequalities appear. And we need to look beyond the mere economic value of social inclusion and treat social equality as an intrinsic value that needs to be at the core of all our policy areas. Our economic governance should be at the top of that list. We need a new social contract defined by equality. And for this to come true, real progress through bold reforms of the rules of the game, both of the financial and labor markets have to be made. The European semester offers in this sense a great tool and opportunity to push and encourage member states to this effect. And I look forward to an in-depth conversation about how this can be done today. Now, without further ado, I have the honor uh, to give the word to Commissioner Nicola Smith, Schmidt, uh, who, has, who as former Chair of Employment and Social Affairs Council knows from personal experience how, member, how European economic policies can affect the social realities of member states. Nicola, uh, the floor is yours. So, thank you very much. Uh, let me first, uh, Thank you for inviting me to this roundtable. And uh, I would also like to congratulate uh, Dr. Lorenza Antonucci and uh, Dr. Francesco Corti for their contributions on this important uh, topic. Uh, I must say, I, I read this uh, report on inequalities in the European semester with great interest. And I learned quite a lot uh, on uh, what can be improved, uh, uh, particularly in this context. Now, I, I share you, your views on uh, how important the topic of inequalities has become. Uh, it is a, a major challenge for our societies. And I would say it's a major challenge also for our democracies. And uh, I, I quote uh, somebody uh, <laughs> uh, who is uh, the, the chair of the European uh, Central Bank, uh, she said, well, uh, among the big challenges of our time, there's the climate change and uh, it's uh, fighting and reducing uh, inequality. 
Uh, and I, I really welcome that th this question of distribution of income uh, has become again an issue because it was put aside entirely. And I also agree with what you just said about uh, uh, poverty. Certainly, uh, poverty reduction remains a, a major issue, but we cannot uh, limit our policies to poverty reduction. Now, um, if there is a, a change in, in, in viewing this, and if uh, now uh, inequality has come again on our agenda, this is also because the uh, narrative, the neoliberal la narrative, let's call it uh, what it is, of the trickling down has shown completely uh, ineffective and wrong. So uh, I think we have seen that with this approach of trickling down, the, the richer become much more, much richer and the less rich they take uh, advantage out of that has not functioned. Uh, and labor markets certainly play a very important role in, 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 uh, in this debate on equality and poverty, but we also have to admit that uh, they are not only part of the solution, they can also be part of the problem because uh, labor markets have gone also in, uh, in a direction of uh, high precariousness, which is also uh, um, um, a cause of uh, higher uh, unemployment. Now, if we have a, a general look, what happened, what has happened uh, uh, in, uh, in the European Union, we see that uh, uh, there is one indicator about the 40% least paid should uh, have revenues going up more rapidly than the average. And this has not happened. So uh, this has not happened. This is a principle, I think, even of the SDG, the principle 10 of SDG, and this has not happened. So inequality have uh, widened in uh, most of our member states. Uh, and it's not just in inequality of income, because we are very much focus, focused on in inequality of income, which is right, but we also have to have a look on inequality of wealth. I think P Piketty showed us that finally inequality of wealth is uh, something which uh, is uh, at the core also of uh, growing inequality in our society. And uh, well, wealth distribution has changed also uh, during the last uh, um, uh, uh, decades and, 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 and has also contributed to the increase of the gaps. So the inc income of the richest 20% of households in Europe is on average five times higher than that of the poorest 20% and up to eight times higher in some member states. And I have had a look just to, to make this remark. Well, what are the uh, member states uh, uh, where it's uh, the highest, where this gap is the highest? And by the way, these are also member states where wages and minimum wages are very low. So this shows also that, uh, uh, that we are right when we say that we have to do something on, uh, on minimum wages. Uh, there's another issue, I think, we, uh, which comes up in, in, your, in your report, which I personally consider also as a very important issue, which is uh, the situation of middle classes. We, we very often, being very focused on poverty, we do not look what happens to the middle classes and the, the lower, especially the lower middle classes. And uh, there is this famous book, The Elephant in the Room. You see, uh, there is this uh, 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 Milanovic uh, elephant uh, who showed cl clearly what happens in uh, the developed countries to the middle classes. And this is a, a big issue also, not only for economic reasons, but also for political and social reasons, because uh, they get the feeling that they are the losers of globalization. Uh, they uh, have uh, a lot of difficulties uh, to pay for housing. And this is an issue very much linked also to growing inequalities because the, the rents and the price of houses have increased dramatically much more rapidly than, uh, than income. Um, another, another issue, an equal access to opportunities. And that's something which is dear to our heart. Uh, 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 this is something which uh, always has been at the core of our policies, uh, uh, equal opportunities for everybody. And we see that uh, in, uh, in fact, uh, this is not working anymore either because uh, this uh, equality of opportunities has been reduced. 
Now, you mentioned the COVID-19 crisis, and um, indeed the COVID-19 COVID crisis has a, a new, represents a new risk, I would even say a major risk, for uh, not only increasing poverty, and we see now the lines uh, of people uh, at, uh, in France, uh, Secours Populaire, Secours Catholique, Resto du Coeur, people who had a revenue before, who had an income, and uh, who have now been pushed in, in poverty and, and, and have to rely on this uh, very uh, special uh, support systems uh, uh, in terms of uh, even uh, food aid because they cannot afford uh, that anymore. And so this is a question also linked to the situation of the labor market, to the precariousness on the labor market, because uh, uh, those who had the most precarious jobs were the first to lose their jobs and, do, and they do not always have the right uh, social benefits to have uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, a decent uh, work. So I think this COVID-19 crisis um, is likely uh, to be highly regressive with the poorest households being the most severely hit in spite of automatic stabilizers, despite of, and this is something really important in what we did in terms of short time work, but uh, we have to watch the consequences of that and, and really uh, imagine also the right policies. And, and we all know that uh, this uh, does not only leave scars for life for the people who have been affected by that, but it leaves also a deep divide in our societies with all kinds of uh, consequences. And there is another issue I, I want to just to, uh, to, uh, to mention, and that's uh, uh, the, uh, the big transformations we are in. We have the COVID crisis, but we also are, uh, are in midst of big uh, uh, technological uh, transformations. The Commission is very much pushing for the Green Deal, rightly so, because climate change is also increasing inequality in terms of health, in terms of, uh, of uh, uh, a lot of other uh, uh, dimensions, uh, energy and, and so on. But uh, it, it has also an impact uh, uh, on, uh, uh, on uh, the situation, uh, uh, on the inequalities. And therefore we have to, uh, to make sure that uh, this uh, Green Deal is fair and just. And therefore we have to insi insist a lot on the just uh, uh, transition. So a strong social Europe uh, for just transitions, that was our basic paper we published in, in January. And now we are working how to implement that also in the context of uh, the Green Deal. Now, the European semester is one tool to monitor inequalities and help develop the right policies. First, I would like to present that the European semester currently does before moving uh, on uh, to the outlook for the future. I will also touch on our policy proposals. As you know, the European semester was initially mainly focused on economic and budgetary issues. In the meantime, this has changed quite fundamentally. The semester is now dealing substantially with social questions and shortcomings in the member states. The, com uh, the Commission has been playing an active role in the shaping uh, of the policy debate, also on in inequalities, through the European semester. Tackling inequalities indeed requires action by member states in a range of areas. I mentioned the design of tax and benefit systems. And here we have seen in the last uh, decades that uh, uh, the design of tax systems has uh, mainly gone to the upper middle class or the uh, upper classes. Uh, the benefit systems have been cut in some uh, member states due to the previous crisis. Uh, our welfare systems have been, uh, have been uh, put uh, under pressure. Another issue is wage setting. And here, uh, obviously, minimum wages are part, as I mentioned it already before. But it's also collective bargaining and the uh, rapport de force between capital and labor. Uh, wage setting uh, through collective bargaining has dropped in many countries, uh, due partly also uh, to the changes in our economies and uh, uh, a weakening of trade unions. Uh, and so uh, in that context, we, we, are, we are very eager to, to encourage member states and uh, to promote again uh, collective bargaining, social dialogue, but in particular 
collective bargaining. Education and training are key, especially also in the context of equal opportunities. And we can say uh, afterwards perhaps uh, something about that. The, the affordable and quality services, public services, a very important issue because we have gone through a period of massive privatizations, which has not always been very helpful, nor for the uh, affordable character, but nor for the quality of these public services. And then uh, an issue which we which is very present in all this debate, uh, which is gender inequality, because this is something which plays uh, in uh, in all kinds of directions. Gender inequality at the level of wages still quite uh, high, uh, more than I think around 12% or 14% as an average in Europe. And this plays also uh, to increase uh, uh, inequalities, uh, overall inequalities. As I said, the focus of the semester on social challenges has increased in recent years. For example, the recent introduction of a national minimum income scheme in Spain has been supported by recurrent uh, country-specific recommendations. Uh, they contributed to set the policy debate for this important outcome. Fighting poverty and social inclusion has become a major topic. Uh, so I, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, and I'm welcome very much the decision of the uh, Spanish government to introduce uh, this uh, uh, minimum income. And uh, uh, the German presidency has now put this issue on its agenda. And uh, we will discuss that during the next uh, uh, the next uh, EBSCO uh, Council. The process of rebalancing between macroeconomic and social aspect of the semester started around mid-2010s. Uh, I can mention three moments. The, in uh, 2015, the, the objective addressing inequalities was explicitly mentioned for the first time in the employment guidelines, which formed the legal basis for country-specific recommendations in the labor market and social sphere. So uh, uh, an important change in that sense that before everything was very much focused on flexibility, 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 and then came up the uh, issue of inequalities. In this field, the polarization of labor markets, which we see due also to technological change, to digitalization, is a central point of concern, as is the question of working poor. And here we have uh, more than 9% of the working force in Europe uh, which can be considered as working poor. The, so which shows that uh, working or being part of the labor market is not a guarantee against poverty, and especially is not a, uh, a guarantee that inequalities are decreasing. The proclamation of the European Pillar of Social Rights in November 2017 further accelerated the process. The semester was identified as the main tool for monitoring its implementation at national level. Third, uh, the introduction of the social scoreboard and various benchmarking frameworks allowed to better assess the design of national systems, especially unemployment benefits and minimum income. This has led to uh, 2020, a year in which, again, we have seen that the social dimension and the issue of inequalities were at the heart of the European semester. The European semester now integrates the sustainable development goals uh, and in its monitoring framework. The updated employment guidelines to be finally adopted now in October include a stronger fairness dimension, taking into account the impact of the twin transitions as well as the COVID-19 crisis. We have also had a substantial shift of approach. The 2020 country-specific recommendations aimed at tackling the socioeconomic consequences of the COVID-19 crisis and were therefore refocused on key topics such as preserving employment, ensuring adequate income replacement, strengthening effectiveness and resilience of health systems. We have now understood the, the, the importance of that, ensuring equal access to learning. All are from a different perspective relevant to inequality. In that context, the PSR in its principle three, the pillar of social rights advocates equal opportunities for all Principle 16 clearly states that everyone has the right to timely access to affordable preventive and curative health care of good quality. A certain number of CSR explicitly refer to these rights. And finally, the upcoming national resilience and recovery plans will be checked against the country-specific recommendations. 
European semester is therefore closely linked uh, with our recovery efforts. And I uh, would very much insist, and this is also a very important aspect in your report, and we had al already also with Laszlo uh, different discussions on, uh, on social investments, uh, because now we, we talk a lot about social re resilience, uh, we talk about um, uh, equality of opportunities, and therefore the investment, social investments are in this context absolutely key. Now, uh, to, uh, to conclude, first, we have to monitor inequalities adequately, both inequality of income, of opportunities, and as I have said, of wealth. Uh, just uh, one uh, indicator, of 20, the 20% 20 of lowest income have also very low wealth. So uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a source for a steady increase, by the way, of inequalities. It is, for example, essential to further progress in making social statistics more timely, to be able to better grasp an issue and take adequate action. We also have to do more on measuring inequality of opportunity. I believe this is where we can make a decisive difference with our policies, education, children, social investment as uh, uh, in, in many fields. Second, and, high, uh, and highlighted by uh, your paper, there is a need of better investigating the role played by different policies, such as taxation or benefits, social transfers contribute to mitigate poverty and inequality. In that respect, the Social Protection Committee has recently agreed in, on a wider set of indicators that allows to look at different aspects of in, uh, income inequality. And third, it is key to look at best practices in terms of assessing the impact of public policies on inequalities and poverty. This is also about the integration of economic and social indicators that you also evoked in your paper. A more systematic use of distributional impact assessment would ensure not only more transparency of the impact of measures on poverty and inequality, but also of the distributional impact of budgetary and public policies. The distributional impact of some measures has been, for instance, already analyzed in country reports within the European semester. Such provisions already exist in the two-pack regulation, but they are used unevenly, unevenly by member states. A more systematic use by member states in the preparation of their budgets would be useful uh, to ensure that distributional aspects are well taken into account. Now, uh, uh, I, I will be very short on the measures. We have uh, published a youth employment support, which is also something to help the young uh, in not just on the employment side, but also on the income side. Skills agenda is very important because we know that a lot of uh, uh, inequalities uh, are caused by low level of skills. And this is also an aspect of uh, lower uh, opportunities. Um, and the minimum wage, uh, we are about to adopt this uh, 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 very uh, important measure. Uh, child guarantee, I have already mentioned, and we will come up with an overall action plan on the social pillar where uh, equality certainly uh, is, uh, is an important uh, aspect. Uh, so uh, to conclude, definitely, we know that equal societies perform better economically because they allow everyone to live well and contribute to the economy. So equal, soci equal societies are also more resilient. Because inequalities do not go away with time, we really have to do something uh, about the inheritance of inequality. And here, children are very much uh, a, a, a key factor. Social mobility, we know that social mobility has decreased. Um, there are even the tendency, and here middle, the middle classes are under stress, that people are moving uh, backwards. Uh, there is an interesting study in Germany uh, which looked at, uh, at the life path of children from low-income families between 1999 and 2019. And in this country, the rich country, one-third of children could not escape poverty when growing up. The study also found that education and access to assistance played a crucial role in lifting other young people out of poverty. So we have some important tools. We have to work on them. We have to integrate them fully into our policies. And here I think the semester is the right way. It's not a perfect way, but it is the way we have 
as European Union, as Commission, to push for a fairer, a better, a more inclusive society, which uh, is also the aim of our political family. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nicola, for this, uh, this keynote speak, and, and thank you for uh, being with, uh, with us in the Commission, uh, carrying this uh, torch uh, further in the work of, of the Commission now in the years to come. We're happy to have you in that seat. Um, also very pleased um, and, and wanted just to pick up a few of the points that you raised in terms of the relation between climate and inequality and their mutually reinforcing nature and how it's important it is therefore to tackle them uh, both jointly so as to um, build resilience in relation to both of these incumbent crises. Um, inequality of wealth and income as well as power uh, is uh, possibly also important to mention uh, from our perspective as a we can't um, fiddle with these kind of inequality gaps without also challenging um, very potent power structures and develop strategies to deal with them. Now speaking from a more political movement uh, point of view uh, is of course also key. And just to end with one thing, and it's been a concern from civil society with the changes now being made in, in the European semester and its linkages to the national recovery plan in the sense that it's not really clear how the participation of civil society is gonna be included uh, and facilitated in this process. So I hope we can engage further in the, in the conversation on how to best um, push for such an inclusion of civil and, and social dialogue uh, in, in these processes of um, assessing the national recovery plans on the basis of the recommendations from the, uh, from the European semester process. So with that said, taking a bit the opportunity of having the torch, uh, thank you very much, Nicola, for your intervention and for participating with us today. We're very pleased to have you with us in this process. Thank you. Now, if you all uh, allow me, um, let me now introduce the researchers who will present the main findings and recommendations of their work um, in the coming uh, part of the program. Professor Lorenzo Antonucci, Associate Professor at the School of Social Policy of the University of Birmingham, and Dr. Francesco Corti, postdoctoral researcher at Università degli Studi di Milano, I hope I pronounced it correctly, and Associate Researcher at the Center for European Policy Studies. Uh, for the audience uh, here in Zoom and also you viewing uh, live uh, at uh, the respective social media platforms, please uh, use the, if you're in Zoom, please use the Q&A or chat function to post questions, interventions, thoughts. And if you're in the live stream, uh, try to well, make use of the uh, appropriate channels in the live streams to comment on what you're hearing and, and during the presentations. And we'll try to make sure to pick them up during our conversations. Without further ado, uh, Francesco, Lorenza, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, just going to share my screen. So uh, first of all, thank you very much to, uh, to the partners for funding this project. Thank you for your feedback when we had the the web back in July, and I also like to thank the commissioner for engaging with the, with the work uh, in such depth. Uh, this was a, a really great chance to understand how to use inequality uh, in relation to the semester, uh, so to, to really uh, apply inequality in, uh, in one of the most powerful instruments that we have to change uh, member states' policies. Uh, so I'll just start from the context. Uh, where, where do we position this work? Um, now, there is quite a bit of disagreement in the, in the literature on uh, what happened to the semester and the meaning of the semester in terms of uh, uh, inequality and social affairs, with some scholars being uh, a bit more positive about how it has evolved and some scholars being a bit more critical of this. But uh, there is a, a convergence on the fact that the semester is uh, the most powerful instrument that we have, probably we have had uh, to affect the national uh, social policies. So that was the, the starting point of this project. Also, the semester has become uh, more political and more linked to the political debates on inequality. An example of this uh, is the parliament resolution, uh, uh, got it uh, led by um, Javi Lopez in 2017. Um, which saw so the involvement of different scholars. I was also personally involved in that. Uh, and it's an example of how the, of, of the, how the spirit of the time, the zeitgeist uh, has changed in the last years. Uh, 
um, of course, uh, a window of opportunity is represented by the European pillar of social rights, um, which has uh, kind of pushed uh, the debate on considering social policy, not just as a uh, productive factor of, uh, you know, a productive factor, so not just for their economic meaning, but also as, as important per se to decrease the level of inequality. This, this is something ongoing, uh, as I will show. And also three contextual factors we need to consider. Uh, the fact that, as the commissioner said, inequality and insecurity have increased. This was happening before COVID, but the current COVID situation is uh, exacerbating some of, the, of these trends. Uh, we don't know much yet, but the data that we have from the US is showing, for example, that the people who, who can afford working online during a lockdown uh, are not people in uh, manual jobs uh, and low, low wage jobs. Uh, and this, of course, shows that uh, there are going to be very important social effects of, the, of, the, of COVID-19 as, as it moves along. Um, the second big important element is how the, uh, the socioeconomic insecurity we analyze in the paper has political effects. This was also mentioned by the commissioner. There, are, there, there is a consistent number of studies now showing the relationship between uh, subjective economic insecurity felt by Europeans and voting for populist parties. Uh, and this is, of course, super important uh, also to lead Euroscepticism. So it's something that EU institutions uh, have a lot of interest in addressing because of that. Uh, and finally, uh, during COVID, so after we started the project, uh, a number of windows of opportunities have emerged, um, in particular um, in the general escape clause, so that the partial depart for the um, you know, microeconomic um, criteria uh, is an opportunity to rethink really how, uh, how the European SMS is going to evolve and the transition when the journal escape clause uh, is, is suspended. Um, so we wanted to, to understand inequality in a pragmatic way because inequality has a lot of definitions, income, wealth. Uh, but what we wanted to do really for this project was to uh, have an operational definition, something that could be applied in policy making. Um, and that is context-based. It's based on how inequality has changed in Europe in the last years. What is the situation at the moment? So we came up with this idea that uh, the policies that address inequalities or should address inequality right now are policy interventions that should address the decline position of both the low and lower middle segments of the population. And they do it directly through social policies, but also indirectly through microeconomic policies and taxation. Uh, and this leads to the three main, aspects, three main dimensions of this framework that we propose. Um, so first of all, the socioeconomic issues should be understood beyond poverty and social exclusion. Uh, second, that there is a loop effect between the macroeconomic policies and the social policies that are, uh, that are politically, in policymaking and academically, sometimes studied as, as separate entities. And then finally, that there is a balance between who pays in in the system uh, to contribution to the system, who gets the rewards. So it's a, it's a fiscal aspect of social policy. And that net balance is really important to understand uh, the, how to address inequalities. So I'm just going to go through this one by one. So the first one, uh, first element refers to this idea that we should move beyond poverty and social exclusion. Uh, now, of course, there have been many changes since the first cycles of the semester, but what I'm referring here is more like the mid the midterm uh, policy dot paradigm where we, we move in, not just in the EU, also in, in the in the member states. Um, and it started way beyond the crisis in 2008. It's, it's something that really we get it from the 90s. Um, so it's this idea that has emerged um, in, the, in, the, in the 90s and then in the 2000s on how do we uh, address uh, uh, the socioeconomic disadvantage in our European societies. A lot of focus has been placed on poverty and social exclusion is still very uh, you know, very present uh, in the, in not just in the recommendation, but in the, in the documents, in the priorities. Uh, some of this has changed with the um, European Pillar of Social Rights. It makes reference to uh, other aspects. Um, but in general, the, the basic uh, uh, understanding of how to address social policies that we should allow people to have high, high level of equal opportunities by investing more in, ser in services and um, some scholars uh, like Ive Marx um, have shown that there is a trade-off between investments being put in services 
and the decline of the cash transfers. So the direct cash transfers that were used before to uh, reduce inequality. And, and this also has resulted in a more focus on labor market outsiders. So people are excluded uh, from the labor market uh, with the assumption of labor market insiders um, uh, were, were more protected. So the idea was let's put more people into uh, the labor market because this is a form of protection from social risks and focus on those that are excluded. Um, now, as I say, with the European pillar of, European pillar of social rights, this, uh, this uh, paradigm is starting to be really shaken because there is a reference to fair working conditions or to the condition of people uh, in the labor market, um, or at least uh, con precarious condition of people. But I will specify why this is also something that could be expanded. Now, the part of it that we are proposing in the, in the paper is to focus on the decline of the squeeze middle, um, which, is, uh, which is an important factor not to be put in opposition to the situation of low-income people, but to understand that there are like broader coalitions in the society that are emerging as the lower middle segments of the population decline and their conditions become more similar to the ones on the lower segments. So that's the idea. It's not an antithetic vision of low versus middle. Uh, insecurity is becoming a major issue, which on one side is, is uh, of course uh, problematic and on the other side, it creates uh, new broader coalitions between groups. You, you see this uh, quite clearly uh, in a political way. Um, and also another thing that has changed is that uh, while job tenure insecurity, so the insecurity in respect to the length of, uh, of the tenure of your job is a problem. Uh, also what's emerging in the literature, referring in particular to the job quality literature works by Gali, is the job status insecurity. So the insecurity in the conditions of work, which relate to things like work-life balance, presence of benefits, uh, relationship with the management, career advancement. A lot of people feel insecure right now about the way the conditions they work and a lot of people feel insecure about potential threats, potential future threats to their condition of work. Uh, this is quite important because it shows that we should also be focusing on labor market insiders, uh, which is not something that's been done consistently. Uh, and the other aspect has, has emerged is the higher financial insecurity affecting middle segments of the population. And this uh, pertains to things like uh, having higher level of debt, uh, which, which is something that is affecting European societies. Um, uh, oops, apologize. Uh, the, the final point is the paradox of redistribution. So is this idea that if we uh, focus on poverty by just putting uh, putting our money, our, our investment in the, in the uh, policy to address poverty, paradoxically, we have more limitations in addressing poverty because the paradox of redistribution shows that you should be addressing inequality, you should be actually addressing policies uh, along different aspects of the, uh, of the economic distribution. Otherwise, you have actually more constraints in addressing poverty. And this paradox of redistribution uh, is, is probably one that we can use to assess why uh, the poverty um, agenda, Europe 2020, was not successfully put forward. The second aspect uh, the, of the framework that I mentioned before is this loop, loop effect between the economic and the social. Uh, this is quite important as uh, a lot of the focus in the, in the studies that have tried to assess the European semester is on how as an effect on economic sphere, no? that you can correct market failures or support the market. Now, the, the big uh, the elephant in the room, as we show here, is the, is the effect of the macroeconomic policies on the social sphere. They can be regressive or progressive. Uh, for regressive or progressive, we don't mean it's not, it's not a political term, but it's, as the commission was using, um, a, very much the economic definition of uh, being progressive or regressive. So a policy that they can increase inequality or can decrease inequality. Uh, some studies like uh, studied by Theodopoulos and Watt uh, of the HY have done this, for example, in 2011 to assess how the countries affected um, by the austerity package were going to be affected also in socioeconomic terms. Uh, so uh, we're not, we're definitely not the first people to propose this, uh, but in terms of policies, this paradigm is still uh, lacking and that's, uh, and that's our argument. What it means to be regressive or progressive, this is done through both policies, 
and, and uh, social policies and fiscal policies. So in terms of social policies, uh, cutting public services is going to be regressive because if, as, as it happens in Europe, low and middle um, groups of the population tend to rely more on, on public services. Uh, and, and of course, this is done also fiscally uh, because cutting the minimum wage, cutting welfare spending, um, uh, and, and in general, having fiscal um, deduction uh, not targeted for the low and middle parts of the income distribution tend to be all uh, regressive. And this leads me to uh, the third point, which is the effect of uh, fiscal policies. Uh, this is a quite important point because, uh, as we as we we have said before, it's been quite uh, neglected in the first, uh, uh, you know, in, in the first cycles. But uh, but it's more and more um, a focus on the semester work. So it's this idea that uh, even if we have perfect equality of opportunity, as Atkins has remarked in his uh, seminal work after Piketty. Um, we still need to do something on the fiscal side um, to, to address the level of inequality. Uh, that is, that is a, something that should accompany any uh, strategy to decrease inequality. So what are the main, uh, main issues in terms of uh, fiscal policy inequalities? Well, taxation is a really important instrument to reduce inequality because uh, at the moment, major losses, the major uh, issues uh, are faced by the bottom 60%. This is coming from a study by Bern Erwan that we use in the, in the report. Uh, so it, it, it's an analysis of what happened even before COVID, okay? So it really confirms this idea that the low and middle groups uh, tend to have something in common here. Uh, so taxation, it would be a key to here to, to redistribute towards these groups. Uh, we also know that, uh, that countries that have uh, broad tax revenues tend to have also less inequality. This is quite important because especially in the early cycle of the semesters, um, there, was, um, there was a tendency of perceiving fiscal pressures as a way of reducing poverty. So reduce fiscal pressure and, uh, and you reduce also level inequality of poverty. But what this is saying is that it's the fiscal pressure per se is not a problem. It's how you actually use this fiscal pressure that can require to increase it. So in terms of how to use it, what is a progressive taxation? Uh, well, we know for sure that consumption uh, tends to have regressive effects, tends to affect uh, low, uh, low and middle income groups uh, the most because they're more relying on consumption. Uh, but in terms of labor and capital taxation, we also need to be careful because the tendency it is that you know, there has been, uh, especially in early stages of the semester, but it's, it's still sometimes present to move away uh, from uh, labor taxation to capital taxation needs to be really breaking down. Labor taxation is not, uh, is not a problem per se because it needs to be considered in terms of the contributions that individuals also take from the system. A good example of this uh, is the situation of gig economy workers that, uh, that are considered self-employed, so they have uh, a more favorable taxation uh, Fiscal, uh, fiscal situation because they pay less taxes, but at the same time, they are excluded uh, by accessing to different social policies, social provisions. Um, so this, the net balance of this is of course negative. So uh, when we consider the taxation of labor, we should take into account about uh, the contributions, but also uh, what the people are taking back from the system. And the same applies to capital. Wealth, as the commissioner said, is quite important, not just in terms of, uh, of uh, taxation of the high income groups, but also of the low and middle income groups, because it's also an instrument used uh, uh, for different aspects of reducing inequality. So the focus should be on wealth concentration rather than the presence of, uh, uh, of wealth per se, because wealth can be also used in a, in a strategic way as a system to redistribute uh, essential assets to low uh, and middle income groups. And now I pass the mic to uh, my colleague Francesco for uh, the analysis of the semester. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Lorenzo, and thank you uh, also from my side to uh, 
to the commissioner for, for the awards and to FEPS and Solidar and all the partners for have, having funded this uh, uh, project. So uh, the, the first question, and we can shift to the uh, next slide, is uh, uh, what was the result of our uh, analysis? What, what we have done basically is uh, applying the uh, analytical framework that Lorenza has just uh, illustrated uh, to the free, uh, to free policy areas within uh, the semester. So the social employment, public finance and economic policy policy and taxation uh, policies. And we did it uh, following two steps. The first step was to look at the actual capacity of the current set of uh, indicators deployed in the European semester to take into due account about uh, inequalities. And the second step was to look at the actual content of the recommendations that are addressed to member states. If we dig a little bit more in the social employment uh, uh, policy areas, we identify three main problems when it comes to indicators. I was reading before the chat during this conversation and one of the participants asked how do, uh, what's the difference uh, between across countries uh, in uh, income distribution between uh, rich and, and poor. And one of the indicators that is uh, the only indicator that is used in, uh, in the semester to measure income inequality is the ratio between uh, the top and the bottom uh, quintile of the income distribution, which is a very good uh, uh, indicator for sure, but it doesn't grasp, let's say, and does it take into account for the middle class inequality. If you look at the uh, worst scorer, let's say, uh, of the um, top, uh, 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 top bottom 20% income distribution in, in, Europe, the, in Europe, the worst scorers are Bulgaria, Romania, and Lithuania. If you uh, instead look at the, the, the ratio between the 40%, bottom 40% of the income distribution and the top 10% of the income distribution, we have Portugal, uh, uh, UK and, uh, and Estonia. So the way we measure inequality actually affects significantly the performance of member states. But uh, uh, two main uh, compelling problems actually emerge in our analysis when it comes to indicators measuring inequalities. And the first one, as Lorenzo said, is the absence of uh, consciousness in uh, um, inequalities within the labor market, which is related to the, uh, to the absence of indicators that account for labor market uh, composition. Um, despite in the recent semester cycles, actually new indicators have been introduced, and as I said by the commissioner, in terms of uh, uh, in-work poor, for, for example, uh, still uh, there is a, a lack of a proper uh, comprehensive understanding uh, of uh, inequalities in terms of in uh, indicators when it comes, for instance, to employment insecurity, social dialogue, uh, working time and work-life balance indicators, job quality uh, indicators. Uh, while on the other side, the attention is mainly on measuring inequalities at the bottom of the income distribution. So uh, AROP, AROP rate, uh, se uh, people are severely materially deprived or household with the low work uh, intensity. And the other problem, as was mentioned by the commissioner, actually is related to measuring inequalities in access to services. Uh, the, uh, the semesters have always paid a lot of attention to social investment uh, and especially to childcare. But actually at the moment we do lack indicators, for instance, that disaggregate uh, data by income um, of the uh, uh, social economic income uh, of uh, children participating to uh, childcare uh, services. And this is a, a missing data that actually is telling about the incapacity of indicators of breast the inequality dimension in access to services. And obviously, when indicators are, uh, do not uh, have an, a comprehensive take on inequalities, the consequence is that if we look at the recommendation that, that are addressed to member states, still we can see a lack of attention to uh, inequality. To do so, we analyze the country-specific recommendation in uh, the latest semester cycle that we could have access to, so 2019. Uh, and, and then we distinguish the social employment recommendation in three main areas, education, labor market, and social protection. And then what we did was actually to classify them according to the orientation. So the content of the country specific recommendation, whether it was oriented to social retrenchment, uh, for instance, uh, um, collective bargain uh, decentralization, labor market deregulation, etc. Second uh, category is the social investment, uh, and then we distinguish between activation policies or so reinsertion in the labor market or upskilling training policies. 
The third category, category was social inclusion. So all those recommendations that are actually addressed, you know, to uh, more, most disadvantaged groups. And finally, the fourth category are uh, recommendation addressed to emerging uh, inequality. So a recommendation that have a positive redistributive uh, impact. And if we see the results of our analysis in the next slides, what we can see is that actually uh, the, uh, in the free policy uh, areas that we analyzed, uh, the dimension of inequality is uh, uh, barely present and is just uh, marginal. In the area of education, for instance, uh, we have 90% of the recommendation are actually social investment oriented. This is absolutely important, but then, as I said before, when it comes to access to uh, childcare services, for, for instance, we do not have an inequality take on that. If you look at the labor market uh, area, then again here, most of the recommendation have a social investment take, which is absolutely good. Most of the recommendation are addressed to reinsertion in the labor market, active labor market policy, et cetera. But still the inequality within the labor market is a dimension which is not actually uh, uh, properly addressed in the, in the recommendation to member states. And if we look at the social protection recommendation, again, we have an over attention to social inclusion recommendation, but still inequality is lags a little bit uh, behind. And as Lorenza said before, the problem of access to social protection for uh, people within the labor market, especially uh, non-standard workers, fixed term contract, uh, self-employed, the temporary workers, has emerged during the COVID-19 crisis. They were the least protected during the crisis. And actually there is not a, a proper take in the, in the semester uh, recommendation. Let's move to the, now to the, to the second uh, area. So uh, what we call the loop between the economic and, and, and the social. In this sense, uh, we would like to advance a caveat because as said by the commissioner, there has been an evolution in understanding of the macroeconomic fiscal framework in which then the social dimension of the semester is embedded. And from 2015 on, we have assisted to a progressive flexibilization of uh, the European semester, which is still uh, much on the discretion of the European Commission to activate flexibility clause up to the re most recent development with the activation of the general escape clause. But this is not related to the capacity of the macroeconomic framework to take into account of the possible negative externalities of macroeconomic recommendation on the dimension of inequalities. And in this sense, we do identify, again, a problem of indicators within the macroeconomic imbalance procedure set of indicators, whereas, for instance, the problem of private indebtedness, which is one of the key uh, internal imbalance, which is identified as a positive and negative externalities for the stability of the monetary union, uh, the over attention on, on, debt, uh, on private indebtedness is not accompanied at the same time on, with the attention on the so-called household financial fragility which is one of the issues that we raise in terms of in incapacity of the indicators uh, to measure the, the inequality uh, dimension. At the same time, the second, uh, the second key risk that we do identify is that an overfocus on uh, general government uh, indebtedness and so the necessity to, for macroeconomic correction might have as a spillover effect a reduction of general public expenditure on, on social services that are actually uh, a be benefit, especially for the lower and, mi and middle class, uh, and middle class uh, people. And, this, and the third problem that we do identify in the, in the, uh, is related to the involvement of so-called so social actors in defining recommendations uh, within the macroeconomic uh, framework. As we know, the MIP is a process that is in the hands of ECFIN or uh, ECOFIN, but and do not properly involve the DG, neither DGM or uh, EBSCO. And this actually affects the, the capacity of the recommendation to take into account of the possible negative externalities in terms of social imbalances uh, that macroeconomic adjustment recommendation might have on uh, general public uh, expenditure. And third, let's move to the third policy uh, areas, and uh, uh, namely the one on uh, taxation. 
uh, actually in taxation, we were pretty surprised in our analysis because uh, as was stressed by the commissioner, the commissioner is actually very keen and attentive to measure the dimension of inequalities and the role of uh, taxation in uh, tackling uh, inequalities. Uh, indeed, if we look at the biannual uh, report of the Commission on uh, Tax Policy in the European Union, we do see a pretty uh, explicit acknowledgement of the importance of uh, uh, progressive income taxation to tackle inequalities, uh, wealth uh, transmission tax taxation, so inheritance, gift, ex etc. Uh, the importance of property taxation, especially on luxurious uh, sec uh, second houses. Um, but what was we were surprised a little bit about, uh, and that, that's why we, we talk about a problem of priority, is despite the uh, quite rich analysis that is carried by the Commission uh, in, uh, his, uh, in its uh, report, uh, this analysis is not translated into the recommendation to member states and is only partially uh, we found it in the country report in which we have actually uh, let's take the example of italy which is the most the closest to to the authors but we have a, a, a very uh, atten a good attention at the problem of inheritance and gift taxes in transmission of in inequalities intergenerationally we have attention to property taxes, uh, but then we actually miss this attention in the final recommendation. And the other problem that we do identify actually is a, a certain vagueness in the uh, recommendation to member states when it comes to uh, shift taxation away from uh, labor. So basically, we, we do observe that there is a, an attention by the Commission and a shift over the cycles of the European semester from uh, uh, away, let's say, from taxation on consumption, etc. Now we have a shift uh, in, in, in the recommendation addressed to member states, but still it's not yet clear uh, uh, in the recommendation addressed to member states how they should readjust their taxation to to, to uh, to, to, to the labor market. And then if we look at, uh, at the content of uh, the country specific recommendation, we again uh, this, uh, classify them in three main groups. So we, uh, uh, we have the so-called progressive uh, taxation recommendation, which suggests to increase the tax base and, and tackling inequality explicitly. We have the regressive uh, recommendation, for instance, uh, 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 taxation on consumption that might affect equally all the distribution of the uh, all the income classes, and then we have a, a neutral recommendation. So, recommendation that suggests to member states a reconfiguration of the tax uh, mix. And if we look at the distribution of uh, this recommendation in the next slide, we do observe that despite the rich analysis in the country report on uh, the problem of inequality and the importance of taxation to address inequalities, still almost 50% of the recommendation uh, on taxation policies are actually uh, kind of neutral. So they ask member states to reconfigure their taxation mix. Then we have a significant share of 30% of the taxation that ask member state uh, to increase the tax base, which is potentially a progressive taxation measures, as uh, I said uh, before, given the focus on increasing taxation on capital. But what is interesting is that these taxation recommendation and increasing the tax base are actually reserved, let's say, or limited to a certain group of uh, countries which has a, a particularly capital-friendly taxation, such as Malta, Cyprus, Ireland, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg, which is absolutely fine, but is not widespread across all the, uh, the member states. Still, we have, as we can see, a recommendation addressed to income inequality and uh, increasing tax on property and capital, which is uh, actually good. But again, what we observe that these uh, recommendations are addressed as especially on Eastern member states. Uh, so which have uh, traditionally a less progressive taxation systems. And, and so they, they are not widespread across all countries. So this is our, these are the results, the main key findings of uh, our report. Uh, but then we, uh, the point is, OK, but how should we proceed? What, what are the recommendations uh, for um, 
for the commission and for, and for, the, and for our patrons. We grouped the three main sets of recommendation. Uh, the first one uh, concerned Sorry, the, uh, Francesco, uh, I yeah? think I've been told by, uh, by the organizers that we're going to introduce the recommendations in the next session. Ah, okay, okay. We are so, over time, uh, so uh, I, I think it's that, probably even more effective because <laughs> okay. uh, we can cut it here and then talk about the recommendations in the Q&A. Okay, thank you, Lorenzo. <laughs> okay, sorry, but that's what I've been no, no. told to do. That's good, that's good, that's uh, good. So let's do that. Uh, and I'm just gonna stop sharing, that's okay. And pass it to the organizers. So thank you. Um, Lorenza and uh, Francesco for this study and this presentation. I'm uh, Laura De Bonfis, the Policy and Advocacy Coordinator at Social Platform and Steering Group member and SDG Watch Europe, and I will be chairing the next panel. So I invite the speakers of the panel to turn on the cameras. And as well, I, I want to remember the participants to put questions either on the chat on Zoom or on Facebook in uh, and we will ask the questions after the, the panel. And uh, also the, the questions will be also to the researchers if you want to ask questions. So um, just to introduce, uh, so just to open up, as we know, the European semester is playing uh, a key role in the implementation of the national recovery and resilience plans. And the reform of the semester process is already, uh, has already started, was in the pipeline, but it's now, it becomes essential to truly really transform this fundamental coordination tool and to put socioeconomic well being as a prerequisite for sustainable and inclusive growth and political stability. So, from SDG Watch Europe, um, we recommend a strong refocusing of the semester towards the fight against inequalities, and we welcome this study. And uh, as the study has highlighted, um, we want to, uh, the semester to be truly aligned in the SDGs and uh, um, with the SDGs and the uh, European pillar in social rights. And we also ask for, it, for adoption of an overarching strategy that would replace the Europe 2020, that would set new targets and indicators that which in this study already makes very useful suggestions. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce you to the panel and they will discuss the study uh, and the implication for policy and politics. So the, the first speaker, um, if you can turn on the, your camera. Yes, okay, I can see you. So the first speaker is uh, Oliver Bontu, that is a deputy head of unity of, uni uh, of union, sorry, of digital employment for employment and social aspect of the European semester, and is replacing uh, the head of unit, Kata Berti, that was having some problems to join us. So, Oliver, I will leave you the floor for the first remarks, and then I will pass to the to the other two speakers. Many thanks. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, so thank you very much for, for this uh, for the invitation to, to this debate um, and, and for this very in-depth study and presentation I mean, that you have just uh, made. I think this is a very timely study um, in the context of this crisis, which is very likely has been mentioned to, to make a, a serious impact on, on inequality and also in the context where we enter this new crisis with levels of inequalities that are uh, above the, the, the pre-2008 levels. Huh? So this raises also a number of questions on the inclusiveness of growth uh, along the last decade. Um, as it's been uh, recalled by the Commission over the years, uh, the semester has also been progressively over this decade shifted towards more and more, and more active um, uh, provision of policy guidance aimed at creating a, a level playing field and, and fairer societies. In terms of policy recommendations, reducing inequalities remains a general goal. So uh, there is not a kind of single bullet, single measure. It's been very clear also from the study that can easily uh, be recommended. So it's, it's about a mix of different types of, uh, of measures, uh, depending on the country, national uh, 
situation and many employment and social CSRs are formulated to tackle the current uh, drivers of inequalities. When we look at employment and social policy, policies uh, more specifically, the, the semester policy guidance has, has had an increasing emphasis on achieving a balance between protecting the most vulnerable categories through anti-poverty and social inclusion recommendations typically and managing also the the transitions to, to reduce more structural trends towards inequalities. So there are a number of, of course, you know, and it's been recalled in the study, CSRs on the inclusiveness of quality of education, ensuring access to services, health and social services, strengthening and sometimes expanding social protection, creating quality jobs and, and, and training opportunities for them. If we come back to the just recently, uh, released the uh, annual sustainable growth strategy. Uh, fairness remains a key uh, priority. Um, and of course, I mean, it is also a balance. It's one of the four main elements that are there. And macroeconomic and social policies are, in a way, I mean, two, two faces of, of the same coin. Before the pandemic, sustainability issues were often balanced also with adequacy and, and access concerns. And, and I, I guess, I mean, the two elements should not be seen as mutually exclusive. On the contrary, ensuring fairness and moving towards a more sustainable economic model implies also addressing imbalances in order to be able to redirect resources to where, to, towards where they are the most needed. And this is also something we can see with a, a growing debate about the, the green transition. Uh, and this is also obviously something which is very much at, at the heart of uh, the, the new recovery and resilience facility, uh, which uh, will be embedded into the 2021 semester cycle. Um, so maybe looking ahead, uh, a few points, uh, uh, because there is, a, there is a lot uh, ongoing in terms of better monitoring inequalities uh, um, and assessing the impact of, of reforms. Um, and it's been mentioned already, but maybe this is something we don't highlight a lot uh, and don't, don't underline, but a key dimension for monitoring poverty and inequalities is, is to improve timeliness of statistics. Because as you know well, social statistics are lagging behind employment and, and macroeconomic statistics. And this, this, this also makes it difficult to integrate. Uh, better in, in, the, in the European semester. So we have been increasing reliance on, on, on flash estimates on now casting of inequality and poverty. Advanced estimates um, are based on modeling of the latest information uh, and are more and more used in the semester. We, we are now receiving the, the estimates for 2019 and we, we hope to have estimates for 2020 still, uh, still this year, which will be the kind of first year where we have a kind of information, real-time information on poverty inequality. Linked also to, to the timeliness issues, there is an increasing reliance on, on distributional impact analysis of measures of budget already in the country reports uh, and it's been re recalled by the commissioner. There is a provision in the two six pack uh, for this and way forward, forward is indeed probably to, to build on best practices among member states. Uh, especially in this time uh, where, uh, and actually, I mean, if we think what would be the outcome in 2020 of such a distributional impact of budgets, probably it would be, uh, it would prove the new measures such as short-term working schemes and various changes in benefit design uh, would reduce reducing impact on poverty inequality. On monitoring, on the monitoring framework, uh, the paper makes a, a number of very, very relevant points. And um, I, I just would like here to, to mention that there have been recently some developments. Uh, of course, it, it takes time uh, to, to improve the motor, monitoring uh, uh, framework. Uh, and maybe all of these are not fully visible in, in the semester or general development report. Or, on the analysis of trends, but uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is important. And of course, there are areas where it, where it is more difficult. I mean, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned, for instance, uh, 
issues related to uh, wealth inequalities, inequalities of opportunity, opportunities. These are, these are areas where it is, it is by construction because these are more complex uh, to measure. Uh, more more difficult to agree with member states. I mean, because in the end, I mean, this is what we need. Right? This is not only to have kind of statistics about this, but if we want to to fit this into the semester, we need to have a common language with member states and agree on indicators that uh, everybody trusts uh, in a way. Yeah? Uh, so what we did recently is um, is uh, to go a bit um, uh, beyond what is already done in terms of analysis of of policies, not only the outcomes, the performance, but the policies. So this is what is, uh, for instance, under the, the be different benchmarking frameworks uh, in different areas, unemployment benefits, minimum income, and there are ongoing discussions about childcare, support of the children, and the adequacy of pensions. So this is to go maybe, I mean, to try to find indicators that allow to monitor uh, not only the outcome, the poverty, the inequality, but what are the policy features I mean that make a, make a difference in this case? Are we, uh, do we have a good measure of the coverage of these benefits? Do we have a me good measure of the adequacy of these benefits and so forth? Uh, so these are the type of, of questions. Um, of course, we are also going beyond in terms of these very general indicators on, on inequality. Uh, there is the interquintile ratio that you mentioned, uh, which is one of the scoreboard headline indicator. But it, it is very useful also to decompose it because it's, it's a very general macro, kind of macro indicator on inequality and to decompose it between the two tails of the income distribution. If inequality increase or decrease, I mean, is it because we are going from, from the top or are we going from, from the bottom? I, mean, I think it's, it, of course it has a number of, of the decline. I mean, is it because there is a decline of inequality on the top of the income distribution or the top? And of course, I mean, when you relate to the different policies and the different design of design issues related to taxation, uh, social, social transfers and so forth, or social services, these are, these are have a number of uh, implications. Um, also linked to the, uh, to the Palma ratio, I mean, that, that has been man mentioned. I mean, we have also included a very similar indicator on the, the share of the income of a lower 40%, which is uh, very similar to to, to this one, which is the, the one which is uh, also linked to the, to the SDG. And there are a number of other, other indicators, such as on the, on the impact uh, on, on this interquintile. I mean, is it, what is the separate impact of, uh, of benefits? Uh, and what is the separate impact of taxation, as you mentioned? Indeed, this importance of looking at the role of, of progressive taxation. So you can compare across the, the countries. I mean, is it some countries are reducing inequalities more through taxes or some are reducing it more through social benefits in a nutshell. And maybe there is room of convergence here uh, mm -hmm. in, in a way, I mean, uh, to, to, to address uh, some of the gaps. Just two, two last points on inequalities of opportunities. This is a very difficult uh, area to, to develop indicators. And some indicators were used up to now, I mean, the semester. We have just recently agreed on, on two indicators which focus on, on, on children, because as been mentioned, I mean, there is all this huge challenge of uh, kind of intergenerational transmission of, of disadvantage. So the, the two indicators are about the gap. The gap for children, um, depending on the socioeconomic background of, of their parents, the gap in terms of poverty, uh, what, what is the gap from, from the early ages in terms of poverty and, and, the, and the gap in terms of educational outcome based on the OECD PISA uh, measures, I mean, which are quite now stable and agreed uh, across member states. I mean, so this is another way, I mean, we have now to look at uh, inequality of, uh, of opportunities. So many thanks um, for Thank the study and all the suggestions and uh, maybe I would stop there and looking forward for, for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. I'll uh, pass now the floor to our next panelist and I just want to, re uh, to remind you that um, for the first intervention you have uh, five minutes. So the, our next speaker is Anton Ron Holm and is Secretary General of the, and the Social Democratic Party of Finland. 
So I'll pass you the floor for, the, for the, your first reaction. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for all of you being in this, I mean, extremely interesting seminar. I'm also the, um, the, um, the chairman of the board of the Kalevi Sorsa Foundation, so we are very happy to be a part of this, um, this work. Um, and um, um, it was, it's also nice to be in contact with, um, with people from all around the Europe. I think behind Nicola, you could see the castle of Vianden, I presume in Luxembourg, because we haven't been able to travel for a very long time. So it's nice to hear a, a bit of um, and see your faces um, as well. And also, my congratulations to Lorenza and, uh, and Francesco. I used to be an um, associate researcher at CEPS as well, and I see the quality has improved significantly since 10 years back. Um, as the, the topic or for our um, panel is on policy and politics, and I'm the secretary general of a political party, there's much more expertise on the specific issues uh, We've already heard and we will hear more and also among you um, who are um, watching. So I will just, as we're Zoom, as we're in Zoom, I will Zoom out a bit uh, and very briefly think on uh, whenever we're talking about a crisis and only a crisis actual or perceived produces real change. And when a crisis occurs, the actions that are taken depend on the ideas that are lying around. I'm sure you, many of you know this, this is Milton Friedman. And we know how this thinking has been used in order to, to produce um, the neoliberal consensus um, on a global scale. And I think for us progressives and for people who actually understand the, the meaning and the importance of the context of this study, we need to be ready and we need to be able to use the found the findings in a time of crisis. If we look at what happened, let's say another crisis in the, within the, in, in the First World War and the swift return to the gold standard and, uh, and the extremely um, dire conditions and the, and the public, um, and, uh, and the, pub, the unavailability of public funds, what, what it created at the time. Secondly, if we look at the, our situation in Finland in the 1990s, uh, when we had the other um, biggest depression in our history, uh, what was what happened after that? Or if we look at the financial crisis, the decisions that were made, um, I think it's it's very imperative for us to decide now what do we want to see after the crisis? What kind of future and what kind of European project we want to see? And then in order uh, behind, uh, let's say, against that background, make the decisions and, and make use of the, the best research um, that we have uh, available, like the one, the study that we are talking about today. So it's about the Overton window um, that we want to shift, where we want to take the European project, what the discussions that will be, and when we're talking about the social pillar and the, and the means to affect the, the European project, that is ongoing now, that's ongoing in all the member states. I hope we will hear more in the national perspectives uh, in this debate or the, the panel. On, on this topic, um, but this is this is now the time to lay the foundations for um, the, the change. What we tried to do in this country, um, we had the elections in 2019, and all the political programs also for our national elections and the European elections uh, were built on a, on a, let's say, a, a threefold uh, approach, is that we're talking about sustainability, but the sustainability is not only economic, as we, if we think of the growth and stability pact, if we think of the um, uh, of the European semester, but it's also ecological and social, and and therefore I think this foundation that you lay in all your discourse, in whatever you're talking, whenever you're um, engaging in in a political debate, is that we need sustainability but there's that that stands on it's a tripod sustainability it stands on on three feet and this is what we're trying to do and actually the in interesting thing is now is that in times of crisis especially the the covid-19 um there's a lot of talk on resilience and when we looked into resilience um especially the nordic societies is that it's not about crisis management. It's not about the amount of oil that you have in your reservoirs or whatever conserves 
of, uh, of food that you stock up. The resilience is built, it's social resilience. It comes from education. It comes from, from people's sense of belonging to a society. It comes from um, lower um, income inequality and et cetera, et cetera. And this is how resilience is built. But this is a message that is still not understood when we approach the idea of resilience through the lenses of, uh, of police forces or army or eventually the, the healthcare system, uh, which is, of course, very important in, in these times. So therefore, I think the kind of studies that we see here, they're extremely important. We see the actual recommendations that we can go forward with, but it requires a lot of courage both on the national level and then on the, on the European level uh, from all of us progressives uh, to do our share and to push for these solutions to, to go forward. Because without us, they will not do. And, uh, and the European project is the creation of you know, people who, who came after us and we owe it to the people who come after us um, that it stays live and it stays as a project that actually serves the people in this continent and around the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anton. I'll, uh, so our next speaker is Bart uh, Van Herke, director of the European Social Observatory. Um, Bart, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. I hope you can uh, hear and see me well. Yeah, I see people nodding. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to Solidar and, and FEPS and the other organizers. I'm happy to be uh, on Zoom with all of you. Um, I read in the invitation for the event that you are uh, proud to present the report written by Lorenzo and uh, Francesco. Uh, and I just want to make it very clear from the start that I agree that this is a uh, a very interesting, a very thorough, and a very, a very well written uh, report. Uh, I'm also reassured. I read, uh, I looked carefully at the acknowledgments and the, uh, the the small text uh, written at the beginning uh, of the report by some uh, very highbrow names, uh, and I'm very sure that the, these authors are embedded in an expert and policymaker community that will make sure that their ideas uh, take hold and uh, and grow. So uh, good for you. So I, unfortunately, maybe for the debate, I agree with much of what is written, but still, you know, for the sake of, of the debate, um, I'll, I'll, I'd like to point to, to three issues. First of all, with regard to the narrative that is behind the report, with regard to the role of the actors, and then some mild disagreement on some smaller points, which we can discuss now or uh, at a later stage. So. Maybe uh, to start, Madam Chair, uh, on the narrative um, of, of the, the very interesting uh, plea and exercise that you're putting on the table. I completely agree, to be clear, with this focus on addressing inequalities in the semester. And I think uh, the, the report provides very, very good, very thorough, substantive, empirical reasons why um, uh, this is the case, why, why we should tackle this now. And the Commissioner has. Uh, endorse them uh, so as to speak. Um, I only wonder, politically speaking, um, whether the, the narrative, the framework that you put on the table uh, to make uh, this approach plausible or operational uh, will do. I refer several times, and I understand why, of course, to the European Pillar of Social Rights as the EU social policy framework. But will this be enough? And this is maybe more a matter of politics than of scientific analysis. But okay, uh, we, we are here with also stakeholders and, uh, and policymakers around the table. Um, I hear much less of the pillar um, uh, for the moment. Of course, we are in a new COVID-19 context. Um, the president of the European Commission, uh, except if I'm mistaken, did not refer to the pillar in her State of the Union. The pillar is visible by contrast in the uh, annual growth survey that was uh, published two months uh, ahead of schedule. So, but it makes me wonder whether uh, this this uh, this framework is, is stable enough, visible enough uh, to make your plea regarding uh, inequalities. And this also refers to a question that was put in the in the chat by by Silvia Rainone. 
Um, and I think this should remind us that progressive forces should make sure that this pillar remains alive, remains kicking, remains visible, uh, in spite of the difficult context. And that brings me to this other framework that is out there now, the Green Deal, uh, which seems to be a promising policy framework to push through this equality or inequality agenda. And we know, and this is uh, acknowledged, uh, that uh, implementing the zero emission society, the just and socially fair transition, uh, pursuing competitive sustainability, as we now read in uh, EU policy documents, uh, will exacerbate existing inequalities. And so I'm just wondering whether you would increase your chances to that your recommendations, which I really endorse, will be followed through, would be linked more closely, more explicitly um, to this new Green Deal framework, maybe rather than the pillar of social rights. Question for debate. Second point, uh, Chairman, is, pertains to the role of the actors in all this. And uh, several uh, speakers, Francesco has also referred to this. You re recommend, recommendation six, involve social actors in drafting, um, uh, in the drafting process of the macroeconomic recommendations. Sure, I agree, obviously I agree. But it seems that the opposite is now happening. And I just want to revisit very briefly uh, the socialization of the European semester thesis as uh, explained a few years ago by uh, Zeitlin and Van Herker. Uh, uh, this socialization included uh, uh, an increasingly strong role for DG employment, the EBSCO Council, the Employment Committee, the SPC, uh, etc. Now, with COVID-19 and the creation of the Recovery and Resilience Facility, uh, and I, I'm, I was surprised that the representative of the European Commission didn't refer to that, um, what, with COVID-19 and this uh, RRF, we see that much of the territory that has been gained by the social affairs players is, in my interpretation, up for grabs again. Uh, the key players, uh, the, the key players are now the recovery task force, which is of course in SecGen, and again DG Ekfin. The Secretary General has again been uh, strengthened. Uh, if you look at the organigram of uh, SecGen, which is very interesting, you should have a look at that. Um, it has the human resources have again been strengthened. It now incorporates all of the European semester officers, which is very interesting new development. Uh, whereas the role of DG Employment, Sante, EAC, in this new recovery process uh, will have to be redefined, and which is more, and there I'm really worried, um, is that the role of the EBSCO Council, of the Employment Committee, the Social Protection Committee in this recovery, in this new process, and while the semester is on hold for a year, is yet to be specified. And the, even the fate of multilateral surveillance, which with Jonathan Zeitlin we described as a the cornerstone maybe of the semester uh, is not uh, guaranteed. Not even to mention, uh, and I saw a, a question on this from Bernie Tracy with regard to the, the collective strategy of the social partners. Well, they do have a collective strategy, but they are not really, they all were already not being heard in the process or to, to, to limited expense in the semester, uh, let alone in this new uh, process. And then we are not even mentioning the role of non-governmental organizations to which uh, Mikhail uh, Lehi from Solidar referred to. So we are facing a situation where the main reference document of the semester is no longer the country report. It's the recovery and resilience plans to be drawn by, by the member states. Um, they draft their plans. Um, uh, and in the end, the debate, the discussions will again be firmly in the hands of, DG, uh, of the ECOFIN Council, of the Economic Policy Committee, and uh, the EFC. But to increase my worry, uh, the semester uh, in 2011 put the Commission firmly in the driving seat. And this, with what is happening now, is no longer the case. Huh? The only CSRs will be produced on fiscal matters. No country reports, as I said. Uh, and so the initiative, to some extent, is back with the member states. So the Commission can only comment on the members or, or only assess the, the, the plans that have been submitted by the member states. And we remember from the Lisbon strategy how effective this is. So to wrap up, uh, some of us, maybe including me, may have been a little bit too optimistic um, that the socialization of the semester was here to stay. It happened, the socialization of the semester, um, but it's shaky. And I would therefore really fully support your call to institutionalize 
the role of the social affairs players in all this. And I want to remind the audience that uh, Sebastiano Sabato, Francesco and myself developed the idea of a social imbalances procedure a couple of, uh, a year ago, more or less, uh, which uh, uh, would have indeed, uh, which was there also to reinforce or to formalize the role of, of uh, social affairs players. Just, Madam Chair, because I know my time is up, I just want to point to a few points, but without discussing them, I want to just add that when you discuss inequality, like you do in a very good way, a very thorough way in this report, uh, I think long-term care should also be flagged as a very important uh, policy area at the EU level, because the EU has, in my view, um, uh, had a, a particularly one-sided discourse uh, focused on fiscal sustainability with regard to long-term care, with some real issues of inequalities that are there. I agree with Commissioner Schmidt, and I'm happy you mentioned this, that gender inequality or the fight for gender equality deserves a greater place in the EU focus on this topic, uh, especially because COVID-19 clearly exacerbated gaps between women and men in terms of social protection. We've done quite a bit of research on this at the European Social Observatory. And then I would like to, I, I'm just not totally convinced, Francesco and Lorenza, about your idea, your recommendation to push for new auxiliary indicators in the macroeconomic imbalances procedure. I mean, the efforts to get there will be very important, also in view of what I, uh, what I think I understood, and namely uh, an enhanced role, in, especially this year for economic players. What will we gain with more auxiliary indicators? There has been a big fight on this two, three years ago uh, uh, between the EU committees. And with what result? I'm just wondering, I'm, I'm not against it, but what would be the, the added value? And then finally, defining poverty and social exclusion as the backbone of European social policy, that's what you write in the paper, I really disagree. So I finally found some dis real disagreement. Um, I think what the EU has done in terms of gender equality, in terms of health and safety at work, in terms of coordination of social security, and recently on social protection, uh, which is one of those sacred cows uh, or where the member states don't want the EU uh, to intervene. Uh, and Slavina Spasova uh, from the OSE uh, put up a question with regard to the monitoring of this council recommendation, which is about uh, to get started. Maybe Olivier Bontou would like to recommend on that. So I think all of these are far more important pillars of social Europe than the fight against poverty and social exclusion. Thanks again for a very good report. I think you struck a very nice balance between an optimistic and a critical reading of the European semester and social Europe. And I'd be happy to uh, continue engaging with you on, on these important topics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bart. Um, so we're running very late with questions. So I want to uh, now just um, invite uh, also the, um, the researcher to the to answer to the question and just taking one question from the floor uh, what the, uh, the EU should do uh, better to address job insecurity in the coordination of EU economic policy and um, I would say also Lorenza or Francesco if you want to highlight uh, some of the recommendation regarding this yeah um, I would invite uh, Francesco to start with the presenting the recommendations so we can then, uh, which are, because it's very much linked to the question that we got. And let's, you know, this, the, the speakers made reference to the recommendations, so it would be a good chance um, to start illustrating the recommendations. Uh, yeah, you want me to illustrate, I will address, pick up some of them while addressing the question by the panelists, which I, uh, who I really thank for the, for the engagement with the with the paper and the nice word, but also the the challenging question, uh, Bart. Uh, I, I was sure uh, I really appreciated uh, all your questions because indeed, let me start with the social actors, which is uh, one of the uh, very challenging uh, issue that uh, has been raised. How does it change the role of social actors uh, within uh, the semester? Social actors meaning uh, EBSCO, uh, uh, M DG AMPLE, but also social partners and also non-governmental organizations. And, and how does it change with respect to RRF and, uh, and REACT-EU? This is, uh, uh, I, I do agree that uh, 
uh, to up to a certain extent, uh, there has been a centralization, let's say, of uh, recentralization of, of the role of national government, which we'll be presenting uh, in uh, five days, the draft of the uh, recovery and resilience plans. And that will be then assessed by the commission and within the commission is the sec gen and, uh, and then DG Hackfin that uh, holds uh, again back the pen uh, in the entire uh, in the entire process, and the, the the reason why we put it explicit that there was an issue of governance when it comes to the loop between uh, a social and economic sphere of the semester, it was exactly because it's not for us it's not only a matter of indicators and um, but it's also a matter of who is involved in drafting recommendation and assessing performance of uh, member states. Um, because these are highly affected the capacity of raising some issues and raising some uh, uh, some concerns and i'm happy you recall the proposal for a social imbalance procedure which is was actually a way to make it structured and permanent this uh, gradual change uh, on which i fully agree that there has been a socialization not only Big, and the socialization, as you rightly pointed out, is not only the introduction in 2013 and 15 of new social indicators in MIP and the, and the progressive introduction of new social indicators. Uh, Olivier mentioned before the, the, the new uh, SDGs integrated in the country report indeed uh, uh, in, uh, in 2020 uh, brought the issue of the bottom 40% ratio to the, temp, uh, 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 to the top percent of the in income distribution. Uh, um, it's not, I was saying it's not an issue of, just of indicators, the socialization of the semester, but it's an issue of the actors. And that's why uh, one of the, our recommendation when it comes to the, uh, how to make the, uh, the relationship between the economic uh, and the overall fiscal framework and the, so, and the social dimension of the semester more attentive and inequality proof, we added as a recommendation, the first one was uh, on uh, involvement of social actors then indicators. Why we decided to, 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 to still put the issue indicator? Because on financial fragility, um, I, I think uh, the, uh, the, the, let's say there is a good point to be raised when you know, uh, when you assess imbalances, in term, internal imbalances in the semester in terms of uh, risk that of spillover effect deriving from uh, private indebtedness, but then you do not take into account of the actual fragility of households uh, in the forthcoming future due to expected uh, or already accumulated indebtedness and expected unexpected expenses, then actually you are missing a little bit the focus, no? Because you, you focus on the indebtedness at the, nowadays and then you do not foresee the indebtedness in the future. So, uh, Thank you, Francesco. And this is just a recommendation yeah. on the macroeconomic. I leave to Lorenzo the floor for the other ones. Yes, and also to answer to the question on uh, job insecurity, if it's possible. And you have one minute, please. The question of job insecurity by uh, Silvia. Which question, sorry? I can't hear. You are muted, Laura, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, so what the EU should do better to address job insecurity in the coordination of EU economic policy? Okay, so uh, I think we won't have the chance to present the recommendations in, in line. So I ask Yulane or Jedde to share the infographics, which, which has a really nice summary of all the recommendations. I really would like to thank Bart for his uh, very, very interesting comments. I, I wanted to jump in on one thing that, uh, that was said, because um, I think Bart, so the understanding of how to address inequality in the semester between Bart and I is a bit different, I think, and, and in this report in that Bart believes, and I think it's a really important point, that social, more social actors should be involved in order to make the European semester more social. And what we're trying to propose here is uh, let's also make sure that the actors that are not social, so the GIAC, FINA, uh, are all aligned with the same paradigm so that we don't have an internal fight between the GIAC and the employment, but that there is an alignment so that we make the microeconomic uh, more social uh, because the social is already influenced a lot by the microeconomic. 
and, and I think those those views are really complementary because if of course you need to have both because you definitely I wasn't aware of everything that has happened at Barty said, which is really interesting because I think we were really trying to be optimistic in the report. And we realized, now I realized, listen to uh, Barty actually being too optimistic because what has happened with COVID-19 is not much of a window of opportunity as into addressing inequality because actually what the gains that have been made since 2011 on involving social partners. And we say, well, that's not, you know, that's not enough. Uh, that's not social enough. Are, are going to be taken back. So, in, you know, we're not jumping in to say um, uh, we should have more, uh, a, a more important uh, role of the microeconomic actors per se. We're jumping in to say we should have what has been done in the last year plus uh, microeconomic actors considering what is the, micro, uh, the social effect uh, and the effect on inequality or the microeconomic recommendation. So it's, it's a higher level. Um, and, but I very much welcome that. And in terms of uh, what can be done on job insecurity, job selling security, so um, a lot of our work, uh, as you will see from the infographic, is on indicators because uh, the European Pillar of Social Rights opened up a window of opportunity for, for changing uh, the debate. As we, we, when, we, when it comes to recommendation, it, it, it wasn't you, it wasn't actually a, applied in a systematic way. And uh, I think Francesca and I idea is in order to apply those ideas uh, into policy making country specific recommendations, you need to put them into indicators. So the big uh, recommendation we have is that to include uh, uh, indicators of job quality that are, are being developed because in, and to overcome the view of the opposition between insiders and outsiders. So to look at the areas that was mentioned in my presentation of job status uh, insecurity, not just job tenure insecurity, it's not just about the length, uh, the threats on the length of the contract, but the conditions of work. If you look at the studies on job quality, they're very, very multidimensional. It's, it's a very extended uh, way of measuring job quality that includes work-life balance, that's an aspect that's been included, but also welfare benefits, upward, uh, what is called upward, uh, mobility in the labor market, cognitive precarity in the labor market. So if you look at the literature on precarity in the labor market, it's a, it's a very extended. So if you include job quality, you have a lot of those dimensions. And, and that's our recommendation in that area. I will cut it here because I'm not sure that we have enough time, so I'm aware of the time constraints. Yes, I'm Anton, if you want to jump in and answer to the question, or I can take another question from the floor. No. Can you hear me? Okay. So I'll ask uh, the final question because we need to move to the next panel. So do you think that there is a trade-off between improving the condition of those who are in the labor market and reducing the number of those excluded from the labor market? Uh, see the evergreen argument, the labor protecting regulation as a counterproductive effect on the inclusiveness of labor markets. And this question comes from the floor. So Bart or Anton, if you want to answer, or oh, Oliver. To be honest, Lara, I'm, I don't feel very comfortable to answer this question by contrast in view of the recommendations that we've heard and uh, the importance of uh, social protection on the agenda. I wonder if, if Olivier Bontou from the Commission uh, would like to comment on the question that I saw popping up on the chat with regard to the monitoring uh, and assessment that is starting now at the level of the member states for the social protection, uh, the access to social protection uh, recommendation, because this, this seems to be a, a politically uh, very interesting initiative that is directly linked to the issue of social inequalities, because here we're talking not about poverty and social exclusion, but access to social protection, which is key in the fight against social inequality. So I don't know if Olivier would like to comment on that. Only for one Thank minute, you very much. So. We can very briefly comment, I mean, yes. and uh, thank you again, I mean, for, for all the comments. I mean, this is, this is a very dense uh, discussion. Um, on, on, on the last question on access to social protection. I mean, indeed, I mean, this is in the recommendation that 
uh, we, we need to have by November this year, uh, kind of monitoring uh, framework for monitoring the recommendation on access to social, social protection. And as you point, I mean, indeed, the question of access to social protection is very central, including in this crisis. Uh, when we see, I mean, that a number of, as it's been mentioned, I mean, people in precarious, uh, and just the question we just had about uh, precariousness on, on, on the labor market, I mean, uh, make a very, very important difference in, in accessing social protection provision. So, uh, indeed, this is the plan. I mean, uh, we didn't mention uh, this is a similar exercise in a way, I mean, as a benchmarking that we have had to look into uh, elaborating a monitoring framework for this. Uh, of course, this will be um, a first step that we have now in November uh, to endorse a kind of uh, first version of the monitoring of accession to social protection. And uh, we will have to, to, to come back to this in the future as well to improve it uh, because it is, it is indeed a very central Central element. Uh, just to, to, to a side comment, I mean, I see there are also comments on long term care. We're also working on long term care indicators indeed. Um, and uh, on this question, I mean, improving the, I mean, I think in the debate about inequalities, improving uh, the kind of, if we, if we say, the rules on the labor market, the situation of those on the labor market and those outside, I think, I mean, I would honestly say it just it is both. Uh, we, need, we need to have both. We need to have both on the labor market uh, policies that are adequate into uh, supporting income, uh, labor income. So, of course, I mean, there are ongoing discussions about minimum wage, for instance, uh, but also for, for those outside or for those in and out of the labor market, as we just mentioned, access to social protection, different types of benefits, and so forth. So, thanks a lot again, I mean, for this very, very interesting discussion. So thank you to all the panelists and the researcher. I'll, I need to unfortunately close the time for the questions, but you'll have time to ask more questions in the next panel. Laszlo, the floor is yours. Thank you. If the floor is mine, um, I would like to uh, introduce uh, the second panel. And uh, with the second panel, we would need to shift a little bit of the, the focus of this discussion. Uh, from the Brussels perspective, we would need to move towards a national perspective. And from analyzing the recent experience, um, we would also need to equally pay attention to the future. Since today we are speaking about reforming the European semester, I would say reforming the European semester again, because to some extent, um, when the Juncker Commission came in, in 2014, they already uh, introduced mainly through simplifications, um, a, a reform of the European semester. But now there is another, not only opportunity, but in a way a necessity, um, because the whole budgetary framework is also changing and the economic perspective because of the coronavirus driven recession is completely different than either in 2010 or in 2014. Uh, the members of this panel uh, will be Miguel Costa Matos, who is a member of the Portuguese parliament and president of uh, the Socialist Youth um, in the Lisbon area and um, an economist by training. Um, Marcus Zeppelin, who is a Finnish Ministerial Councillor for Social Affairs. And uh, last but not least, Julie Rosenkilde, who is a director of NUT Europa from Denmark. Uh, you probably didn't guess from my pronunciation, uh, but um, uh, she is also going to join the panel. I wonder if uh, we are all here now. Yes, I think so. Um, uh, and let me just um, uh, you know, ask a brief question from everybody before taking the floor. Um, the national experience I think is very important because it's probably very diverse. In different countries, uh, probably there was a different perception and response and satisfaction or dissatisfaction with uh, uh, the European economic governance in general, but more specifically with um, the European semester. 
and especially one part of the semester, which is the so-called country-specific recommendations. And diversity, of course, is linked to the fact that the country-specific recommendations have been country-specific, i.e. probably very different in Denmark than in Portugal, very different in Finland than in Italy. Uh, so there is certainly a room for a diversity of views to be brought uh, together, but I would appreciate if uh, your assessment is also coupled with uh, suggestions, expectations about the future uh, the form and shape and size of, uh, the, of the semester uh, regarding what is the a type of interventionism from the European institutions, which would be seen as desirable or positive or progressive uh, within your respective member states. So in a nutshell, this is the, uh, the list of questions um, I would like to uh, give uh, to everybody and ask first of all, Miguel um, to, uh, to, to, to share his views in let's say, uh, four or five or six minutes, and then we would um, allow equal time to everybody before a Q&A. Miguel, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Laszlo, and thank you to David and to everyone who put together this wonderful event. It's a real privilege to be able to be a part of this event, and congratulations as well to the authors of this amazing study. I mean, when we're talking about the European semester, for sure, the country-specific recommendations have been a major issue in political debate in implementing reforms in Portugal. Um, and while we say that there has been a socialization of the European semester, for sure that there have been social issues or issues with social impact that have been discussed and recommended uh, through the CSRs for many years and with big impact. I recall in the beginning of uh, the, the Costa government, so four years ago, four or five years ago, um, the European Commission was rather forcefully saying that Portugal should not be increasing the minimum wage, which at a time where people were needed to recover their wages, to recover their incomes in order to consume, in order to get out of the crisis that was imposed by austerity, increasing the minimum wage was a key policy in order to drive up demand and to get us out of the crisis. And so, um, it's important to say that, yes, there has always, always been a social dimension, just not without, without, not with a social concern. A social dimension, but without a social concern. And this was something which Commissioner Schmidt said very well, I believe, in, in his statements. I mean, I, this has obviously evolved since we had a European pillar of social rights and the introduction of the Joint Employment Report and the scoreboards has been very very important there. And we have noticed not, not only a difference in the monetarization of indicators, but also a shift in terms of the discourse, the narrative that has been adopted towards social policy. I mean, recently we had a European Commission uh, recommend things about segmentation of the labor market, not in, in a flexibilization sense, but in the sense of reducing precarity. Uh, we have had the European Commission recommend better adequacy of social instruments. For example, in this, in this aspect, it would be interesting to hear the Commission not only mention VAT gaps and gaps in, in sort of economic regulation and, and, and economic efficiency, but also in the efficiency of social policies. For example, a gap between social policies and their take up by people. We, for example, here in Portugal, we have a welfare state, which is um, very much uh, disconnected from people when we had um, social tariff and electricity, only 70,000 families were taking up this policy. When we use databases to give automatic access to everyone who was eligible, this went from 70,000 to 700,000, a 10 times increase because people were not adopting all the instruments that they had, uh, that they were able to, to adopt. I think the, the, the points made about information are very, are very useful. The points made about ownership of the policies are also very useful. Involving social partners in this discussion would be useful in order to improve sort of the connection to reality, but also in order to make sure that these policies are actually implemented. But the most important thing I think is not only making these scoreboards and these reports a top up to the European semester, because currently they're a bit, you know, they're, they're on top of, of the main analysis, 
but integrate them. Close the loop. Make sure that we, we not only discuss the, the uh, economic impact of social policies, but the, sorry, the social impact of economic policies, but also the economic impact of social policies. And there are so many good positive effects to reducing inequality, to improving the welfare state. And I, I think it was very pertinent what people said about quality of work, but it's important to also consider beyond quality of work, public services, in the sense that they, they create non-monetary income for a number of people who enjoy these public services. Just to wrap up, um, as we look towards implementing uh, this socialization of the European semester, it's interesting that uh, our, our panelists talked a lot about tax and talked a lot about fiscal rules. Uh, in terms of tax, I think it'd be interesting to identify key features in the tax system which we need to change in order to make uh, the European semester more progressive. And I'm particularly interested in, for example, tax deductions, because in Europe, most of the time they are not refundable. And so who benefits from tax deductions? Mostly the middle class and not lower income families. And therefore that is not an instrument for redistribution. Lastly, about fiscal rules. I'm currently working with Shaheen Vallet, who many of us know as a, a great economist on European issues, on how we can reform fiscal rules. I think these, the suggestion is very important, but I would refrain from going to the expenditure rule too much because it introduces a bias against government spending. And really, we should be looking at the balance, balance of receipts and expenditures. For sure, we should exclude public investment, but I think just to wrap up, we should also exclude other types of spending, not just public investment in terms of capital spending, but also investment in public services and investment in climate action. Not only looking at financial sustainability, but also social and climate sustainability, as was mentioned in the last panel. Thanks so much, Laszlo, for a great panel. Well, um, I think this is a very ambitious agenda vis-a-vis uh, -vis the European semester. And um, I wonder what is the perspective uh, from Finland? Uh, Marcus, please, the floor is yours. Marcus. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. I hope you can hear me well, because the sound here is a little bit uh, uh, disturbing at the moment. And the connection is not the best one. But uh, well, I have been uh, uh, following this uh, European semester almost uh, from the very beginning uh, as a member of the Social Protection Committee. And I also recognize uh, very well the trends uh, described in the study. Now it asked me to start my video. Can you see me? Not yet, but uh, we can hear you. So. Okay, fine. I try to st start a video also. Well. No, well, I co continue speaking. Actually, and my my idea here today is to make uh, that kind of a comparison between the EU discourse up to now, also uh, linked to this uh, semester process, and the traditional like uh, Finnish or Nordic welfare state discourse on social policy, because there are certain fundamental differences in these two approaches. And actually, the starting point of the discussion is the first difference I want to point out. So that do we focus on the bottom of the income distribution scale so that we are talking about minimum levels, minimum standards. It's like the European narrative has very much focused on that. And in this kind of Nordic traditional welfare the uh, state uh, narrative, we start from the middle of the scale so that the average uh, decent level is like uh, something that we are striving for. And the minimum standard is the worst uh, standard possible. And decent living standard is closer to the average so that we start from the middle, from the average and not from the bottom. That's, uh, that's one difference. And of course, if you are talking about inequality, it has to be looked uh, in relation to something. If, uh, if you talk about the poor 
uh, then you should also consider the rich so that they are the two uh, sides, two faces of the same coin. And that's something that we are not uh, focusing, we are focusing only on the poor has, uh, has, uh, and the rich per persons or the rich uh, affluent segments have been uh, rather absent from the EU uh, discourse. That's, that's something that uh, uh, is not very much in line with, with the thinking that we are used to. The second point is like the social rights uh, uh, and their relationship to social obligations. Do we focus only on social rights that are universal? Sometimes in the EU discourse, uh, we also refer to that kind of conditionality in some cases, for example, if we are talking about unemployment benefits how they should be uh, conditional on these uh, activation policies and activation measures. But there should be that kind of balance between social rights that are universal and also social obligations that are also should be universal. And that's the, again, this kind of Nordic uh, thinking that the traditional Nordic view is that social rights, they concern everybody, but also social obligations should be equally shared. And both should be discussed uh, simultaneously to avoid that kind of clashes between different groups. It does not mean that the, at a certain point there should be a strict uh, uh, balance of rights and obligations of a person. But in a broader uh, sense, in a broader view, life span view, uh, sub, such a balance is somehow justified. And both poor and rich, employed and unemployed, or employees and employers, they have certain obligations to contribute to the public good or common well-being. And the Nordic welfare model, of course, it has based on the idea that everybody gains from the system and everybody contributes to the system as well, maybe in different ways. But the aim is to reach uh, an acceptable balance and paying taxes is one element of showing those uh, uh, social obligations uh, and, and, and uh, part of that kind of social con contract. And it's very important also from our point to, to keep people in the same system. And uh, one lesson from the Nordic systems is that you shouldn't rely too much on solidarity uh, to say that kind of uh, benevolent uh, charity attitude it has not proved to be very sustainable in the long run. Mm. And actually the last point, uh, I think that there's main difference is also to uh, somehow how we, how we use this kind of universal approach or do we uh, concentrate and focus on the selective targeted uh, measures. And uh, well, if we uh, use that kind of a selective approach, then we focus on, on, on the poor, the most vulnerable uh, or disadvantaged uh, groups in the society. But in the Nordic way of thinking, we have already, already uh, or, uh, always emphasized that everybody is potentially vulnerable to social risks. And we are all like a part of the same system. So that the universal or targeted policy approach uh, it's about that, that uh, we share the same destiny as part of the same social system. And that feeling is also very crucial to maintain the social cohesion. So it's very aligned to the Nord Nordic thinking that there are vulnerable groups over there and there are people somewhere over there and we do not have anything in common with them. So that we are all potentially vulnerable in certain situations, and that might occur very unpredictably. Uh, and uh, and uh, as this kind of a COVID uh, uh, crisis has proved, and that's why we all like con want to contribute to the social safety nets uh, to get support and benefits when needed. And if we start to use this kind of very, very uh, targeted measures or selectiveness, it takes us away from this universal holistic social policy towards scattered and fragmented interest and, and that kind of dividing, contrasting relationships. Mm -hmm. And one of the strong points of this Nordic welfare model has been that create that kind of sense of togetherness 
and it has been a very clear uh, a strength uh, that has managed to promote that kind of equality in many fears of life. So that the, the, in summary, is it about us that we are talking about, or is it about them some, somewhere else that we are talking about? And there, that's the difference in this uh, Nordic and this kind of European narrative up to now. And I, I think that in, in, from the Finnish point of view, we would like to change a little bit those, uh, those points so that it, it would be more close to this uh, traditional Nordic way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And if you ask okay. about these uh, country-specific recommendations, well, we have been quite satisfied with, uh, with those. They have been in line with the national, national we, uh, view and the national policies, and they have been quite acceptable. But of course, there should be that kind of national ownership that is a very important, uh, that you really think that we are talking about this uh, same, uh, with the same ideas that they, they promote uh, our system, so that because there are differences in, in the welfare models in the Europe, so you should take into account those. Thank you very much. I stop here. Thank you, Thank you. very much Thank for your you, attention. You you very clearly explained that some kind of social contract um, has to exist behind the well-functioning welfare state. And it's very difficult to reproduce at the European level. But let's see um, the perspective uh, from Denmark. Julie, you're still there? Yes. The floor is Hi. yours. Thank you so much, uh, Laszlo, and, and, and thank you so much for the invitation for this panel. It has been uh, very valuable to listen to all the different uh, panel discussion and presentations, and, and also from my side, uh, congratulations on the report. Um, uh, it's it's very useful for, for, for me as representing an, an NGO. Um, and I think it can be used to, to strengthen the also the monitoring and reporting on inequalities uh, via the semester process. Uh, in the last panel, I've, I've of course heard what Bart said uh, on, and his worrying about the semester. I will have my my positive hat on, even though I'm uh, representing a CSO. Um, so, but let me start saying that uh, I'm more new to the semester process than, than Marcus. Um, I uh, have been involved in the process on a national level here in Denmark. Uh, the ministry have a stakeholder group called the contact committee and have been following the, the 2020 strategy and the semester process. Um, I've been involved for the last two years, but I'm actually quite a fan of the semester process. And I see many opportunities uh, to, to reform <clears throat> this uh, process, both on, on national and European level. And that is what I will touch upon in, in my statement here. Um, because now we are in, in, in an end of a period as well. Um, we need to come up with new proposal for the semester, especially also because we have an end of the of the year 2020 strategy, which we haven't really touched much upon today, but I will though. Um, I also feel that we are in, in, in between processes of the reform of the semester because now we have the recovery plan, also part of the semester. It, um, and it gives us also maybe a bit more time to come up with concrete suggestions for the post-COVID European semester reform to, to say. Um, but I see now that I, I think we can also learn from the now kind of established recovery plan in the semester process, even though it has happened really, really fast. Um, but there's something in the process we can learn from. Um, as far as I understand, and it has also been touched upon a bit here, is that um, there has been civil society involvement in the U on the European level in relation to the recovery plan, which is crucially important also for the semester process. The Commission have, uh, have urged member states to involve different stakeholders in, in the making of the national recovery plans. And I really hope that this is being done across the EU in its member states. However, in, here in, in Denmark, I, I don't really know any stakeholders who have been involved, at least not civil society organization, which is of course not a good sign, but there's still some days until uh, October 15. So I am not all critical. Um, furthermore, uh, in the current uh, annual sustainable growth strategy and also in the recovery plan, there are some political guidelines which give uh, guidance and criteria to member states on how to, to, to make the recovery plan. And, and they don't really live up to these 
criteria is there are consequences. Um, you don't get funding, you don't get money. So this makes this uh, process a bit more hard than soft, which is explained in the, in the, the report as well. Um, there are concrete criteria on reforms. There's on investment, investments uh, in, in the digital and green Europe. And this is interesting. I'm not going to talk about the in-depth discussion of, about the political targets in the recovery plan. I believe they can be more ambitious, but the framework and, and process around it is, is somehow positive and something I think we can, can learn from. But back to the, the semester process and how it has been for the last years. Um, so for the last 10 years, member states have reported on the 2020 strategy and they have of course reported on collective and national targets. Uh, to be sure that member states live up to the implementation. I have been looking at the at different uh, national reform programs uh, for, for this year, for 2020, and many member states, including Denmark, are still mainly reporting on the 2020 strategy. And this has been done every year, uh, even though uh, that there's on EU level, it seems that there are more that the 2020 strategy have been away from, from the political leadership for, for, for some years. So there is a discrepancy on this, that member states report on, on the 2020 strategy and the commission uh, reports on, on something different. But uh, so in Denmark, the last years uh, have been reported and on the 2020 strategy. And even though Denmark has come up with some of its own criteria on, on national targets, it hasn't unfortunately not really been taken seriously. The same with the CSR, um, and and I see that in the, in many other member states as well. Um, when we look at the new social targets and indicators uh, and the social scoreboard, it has not been introduced in the Danish uh, national reform program. It has been introduced in the Commission uh, country reports, but not in the reform program. So I think that's something we also need to work on when we talk about the reform of the semester process. Um, however, this year the Denmark has included the Na the SDGs within the national reform program, but only those who were in line with the 2020 strategy. No new targets, no new indicators were used in report. Um, not even all relevant SDG targets were used. Uh, at first, uh, SDG target 10 on inequalities was, was not included. So I think that's something to, to work on. When we look at the reform of the semester process, I think it's important to have this overall strategy, which all member states can report on. And there needs to be some kind of political guidelines, just as seen in the 2020 strategy, uh, because somehow member states uh, need this. Um, now the, the SDGs has been included in the semester process, and therefore I suggest that the 2030 agenda is the obvious choice. Um, and also because it's, uh, it's a strategy which is not owned by the commission president in this term, which uh, was the issue with the 2020 strategy. Uh, Younger, he wanted to make somehow his own plans uh, and not just use the 2020 strategy from Barroso. So, so we need some kind of overarching strategy like the 2030 agenda, um, which also will live after the end of the period of Ursula von der Leyen and maybe until 2030. Um, and two more things, which I think is, is important uh, for the reform is that we can we can learn from the recovery plan, which I just said, we can learn about some of the commitments uh, that's put up, that there would actually be consequences for member states if the political targets and indicators are not met. Um, and maybe it becomes more hard than soft. Um, I'm still not sure it's the best way, but at least we have to look into it. Secondly, it's all about stakeholder engagement. And stakeholder engagement is important, which Mikael also said in the beginning because it can, it can help uh, member states accountable for the commitments. So they actually live up to what they say because political targets are easy to formulate, but it is following action which counts. Um, stakeholder in engagement is crucial in, in the semester process. And that's why I'm happy that the commission has showed political leadership in the recovery plan. And I hope at least that some of the mechanisms which we have in Denmark on stakeholder engagement in the semester process Will uh, will still be there in the in uh, during the reform, um, and and these participatory instruments are put in place, and I think that has to be a stronger instrument uh, in the future. 
I know that I haven't really touched upon the indicators and the targets on inequalities. Uh, I'm, I'm quite aligned with the with the report, and maybe we'll discuss this further. But uh, once again, thank you for the invitation, mm -hmm. and I look forward to the debate. Thank you so much, Julie, especially for highlighting the link between the Europe 2020 strategy and the European semester, because that's exactly the origin of the semester, to be a kind of implementation arm of the Europe 2020 strategy, which unfortunately was, as you said, sidelined uh, during the Juncker uh, period, and then the semester was left without a kind of finality or common uh, long-term purpose or objective. Look, uh, we only have about 10 minutes left. I suggest the following method. I read three questions that came from, from the audience, and in the previous order, you will have the opportunity to pick whichever you like best and respond to these questions. The three questions are the following. Um, one about the youth, uh, which uh, of course suffered uh, from the previous crisis in the forms of uh, unemployment especially, but the COVID-19 crisis also is very harsh on the youth. Do you see a possibility for the European semester to help uh, young people in various ways? The other one from Masha Smirnova asking about uh, health and long-term care. Of course, this is very much uh, relevant for the COVID context. Is there a way, for example, through incorporating an indicator um, uh, to take into consideration uh, health, long-term care, and informal care in the European uh, semester? And the third question uh, about the connection with the recovery plan and the recovery instruments that have been newly created could the semester be the tool to provide the orientation for investment, maybe through conditionality, but that would enhance uh, the potential, the effectiveness of the semester, because a lot of independent analysis is actually suggesting that the semester has been largely ineffective, not really impacting on the economic and the social reality in the member states. Uh, look, these are three diverse questions. Uh, these all came from the audience. Um, Miguel, would you like to start? And I think we only have, let's say, two uh, minutes per panelist to respond. So please be very concise. I will be very brief. In terms of uh, the recovery plan, I mean, there's already some degree of alignment and uh, with the European semester. I'm fearful of conditionality. Uh, being used as a sort of troika instrument to force reforms. And so I'd be careful going there, though alignment is for sure necessary. In terms of health and long-term care, just to give the note that uh, aging concerns in terms of care are included already into the, into the calculation of the debt sustainability analysis. And this can be brought into the, into the mainstream of the European semester. Lastly, most importantly, youth. The youth guarantee in my opinion, was a clear failure across the European Union. It did not provide effective solutions and responses to the young generation um, during the 2014-2020 the period. And so as we go into this crisis, it's very important that we look specifically, as we are looking distributionally, that we look at what are the particular experiences of people who are starting their professional careers, who are in higher education, and how we can make sure that they're opportunities are guaranteed, because if we don't, labor market scar scarring, uh, their effect in terms of the long term, of their wages, uh, of their skills will be huge, and we need to address this now. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Very clear messages. Uh, Marcus, uh, what was your favorite question? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, the first question, I didn't hear it uh, so clearly because the sound is very tinny at the moment, but concerning this uh, recovery plans and uh, conditionality, I suppose that uh, to some extent, uh, some kind of conditionality is desirable uh, in order to achieve the aims. Uh, but uh, still, uh, there should be that kind of, we shouldn't forget uh, this uh, national ownership so that it has to be 
uh, agreed uh, with uh, uh, all the parties uh, that are involved in in implementing those uh, recovery plans. About the health and long long term care, the indicator. Of course, there is a lot of room to develop uh, those indicators, and I suppose that uh, uh, there are that kind of efforts uh, to um, put uh, health and long long term care and informal care in the same uh, package, uh, so that uh, you can measure measure the outcome. But uh, it's it's very uh, it it. It demands a lot of that kind of expertise uh, and also time to create new indicators. It's not so so easy. And the first question it was about use use guarantee. Yes, uh, exactly. If uh, if there is a way to help the use through the semester. And uh, the, there, I suppose that the best way to to change those experiences and best practices also between the countries because many member states also they have their own uh, own plans and programs for uh, to implement this youth guarantee and there is a uh, room for that kind of exchange of good uh, good and best practices okay thank, thank you, you. wonderful uh, julie the floor is yours yes thank you um i would do it really quickly i, I put uh, question one and question two uh, together uh, saying yes I think it's I think it's possible especially now uh, again when the SDGs has been introduced into the European semester so if we get real indicators um, better indicators that the one uh, made by Eurostat I, I really believe that the semester could be a way uh, to secure this but of course it needs courage as Anton also said in the uh, in the last uh, panel. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. And I think um, uh, we completed this round um, very much on time. Uh, I thank you, uh, all three of you, uh, for the participation and also the audience for uh, the questions. And um, I believe it is my role uh, to invite our president, Maria Joao Rodriguez, uh, to share with us her uh, thoughts about the perspective ahead, how to revise the EU governance for better social outcomes. Very well, so... The floor is yours, Maria. Yes, so the image and the sound is okay, no? Can you hear me? Yes. In the image, that's okay now. Very good. Thank you, uh, Nazo, and the pleasure to join you, all of you today. I think it was an amazing online conference. Uh, the starting point, as you know, was a very good partnership with the long work with our researchers together with the uh, SOLIDA, FAPS, and then three our member foundations, one from the South, another one from uh, the Eastern Central Europe, another one from the North. So very good uh, combination. And uh, I think that we uh, should be proud of coming up with relevant recommendations. And let me tell you why I think so. Well, uh, I will tell you something which is uh, based on my own experience with European semester uh, since the beginning, in fact. And um, let me tell you that we should uh, really be aware this is a unique governance instrument in the world. We Europeans, we are inventing something really new. Because uh, the problem is, how can we, at the continent scale, coordinate our economic and social policies 
while we also take into account our diversity. And we inventing something new. Uh, the starting point, in fact, uh, is back uh, with the Lisbon strategy when we were asking how can we bridge between a European strategy and what is being made in the national level. So we invented the first uh, shape of the national programs. But then, yes, in 2010, the European semester was defined as such. We went uh, afterwards to a kind of a difficult period uh, because the semester was being used to impose uh, blind austerity. Uh, but the main purpose at the beginning was to implement a growth and transformational agenda and uh, take into account already the digital transformation, the green transition, and bringing the social dimension much stronger to the scene. Nevertheless, it is true, and many uh, speakers today underline this, that the approach was too limited to social exclusion and poverty. Now, with the European pillar of social rights, we can have a kind of qualitative uh, leap, I believe, uh, for three reasons. One is because the social dimension is really grounded on a new concept of European citizenship with social rights, rights and, of course, duties. The second reason is because we were dealing with the different forms of social inequalities and inequalities within countries, between countries and between uh, generations. And there is a third reason is because uh, we could mobilize the entire toolbox of the European policies not only the so-called open method of coordination, but European legislation, financial instruments, and uh, the overall toolbox in, in fact. So the potential is there. Let's see how this potential after the proclamation in Gothenburg three years ago, will be translated into a proper action plan something which is supposed to happen during a Portuguese presidency in the social summit in May 2021. But in the meantime, of course, we are dealing with this big shock of the pandemics. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, right now we received the proposal of annual growth survey and uh, the frame for the recovery and resilient uh, programs. All member states somehow are preparing this and we need to uh, shape this in a progressive direction. So um, the main ideas I'd like to underline are, first of all, uh, we need to build on the general frame proposed by sustainable development goals. Yes. This should be the overall purpose of the European semester. So let's not uh, lose sight of this. So this means that uh, when now we are announcing a new growth strategy driven by the Green Deal, taking into account the digital transition and strengthening social fairness, let's not uh, forget that the, the soundest basis for this is SDG's agenda. Yes. Um, this means that when we come to the European Commission proposals, we need to insist on this point and uh, also to, to strengthen the social dimension in the overall strategy which is being proposed. In my viewpoint, we have quite big improvements. 
and this is due to a, a very well coordinated work among our commissioners and our progressive actors, European Parliament Council. We can see already important differences. First of all, on the way um, macroeconomic policy is being used, we have some of Uma Manuva. We recognize that uh, uh, macroeconomic policy should be uh, counting on escape clause during the pandemics. Secondly, we refer to reforms, but we emphasize most of all the need of investments, including social investments. Uh, and we keep this focus on the green and digital and, and fairness. So this is a, a good start, but uh, I believe this is something we need to improve. And that's why the recommendations which are uh, now uh, being proposed in this uh, webinar are so relevant, I believe. Because with the uh, sound evidence, we are showing why it's so important to monitor social inequalities with a large range of indicators. Secondly, because we show that macroeconomic policy does have social implications in the other way around, and that's why somehow the uh, procedure to follow macroeconomic imbalances should be complemented with the procedure for macro social imbalances. Uh, with these, we could have then um, balanced dialogue, for example, between social affairs ministers and finance ministers. And our third recommendation is highlighting the importance of addressing uh, the taxation issue and more general, in fact, the redistribution issue. Because uh, social inequalities are widening now. So something more fundamental must be done. And we are concluding that uh, this requires a quite big shift in tax policy. First of all, fighting tax avoidance. Secondly, uh, introducing more progressive tax systems. Thirdly, going to new sources of taxation. And this is a major shift, but uh, well um, founded because we see that the sources of wealth creation, they are also changing a lot. If you think about what is happening in the digital area, you will understand there are big sources of wealth which are not uh, properly taxed. So I really believe that the recommendations proposed by these policy reports are an extremely valuable contribution for the ongoing uh, discussion. Uh, and uh, let me conclude by saying they should be translated in the country specific recommendations, in the scoreboard to follow the European semester, and also in the European flagships, which are being proposed by the European Commission. Because we have European flagships for green transition, for digital, and on the social so far, we only have one focusing on skills. Of course, this is uh, extremely important, uh, but I believe that others could be added. Example, investing uh, in um, well-developed care sector with the different kind of care services we do need. So I, I think that um, these are the kind of uh, proposals we can launch after this webinar. And on behalf of FEPS, I'd like to express uh, our gratitude to all the speakers, all the, the participants, also very lively. And of course, uh, all the FEPS team behind which enable us to run such a, a rich and inspiring webinar. And like that, I think we can consider this uh, closed, but of course we'll go on working together. Many thanks all of you.